Hi, John McElroy here talking all things automotive. Hey, can the U.S. really get all the raw materials it needs for electric vehicles and even beyond that, particularly rare earth? We're going to find out today because we've got Josh Ballard. He is the CEO of an organization called USA Rare Earth. Josh, great to have you here and tell the audience, what is USA Rare Earth? Thank you, John. USA Rare Earth is a company whose mission is to build out the rare earth and rare earth magnet supply chain. And what a lot of people don't realize, but what's really come up in conversation a lot here over the last couple of months is that rare earths literally drive a lot of our technologies here today. They're critical for EVs, uh, but they're frankly critical for a lot of modern technology. And they're especially in the sense of what, how we use them in magnets and magnets are, are the technology that translate electricity into motion. And that happens in, in many, many different ways and throughout a car, as you think about whether it's an EV or even a gas powered car. This was technology largely developed in the United States. We've got the raw materials needed to make it in the U.S., but China dominates the segment. What happened there? What happened is a few decades ago, China decided to focus on it. We decided to give it away. So in the early 90s, there was a vice premier in China who said the Middle East has oil. We have rare earths. And they really drilled into that, no pun intended. They really went deep into rare earths. Uh, they've been building out this industry for the last few decades. And along the way, we just let it go. We didn't want to compete. We decided we wanted uh, to let somebody else do it. You know, it happens in, it's happened in a lot of industries. But unfortunately, in this one, it's happened with a pretty critical, a key component to so many modern technologies. And it's really left us in a tough, tough spot. My understanding is that California has the largest hard rock rare earth mine in the world. Is that right? Yeah, not the world. In the United States, it's, okay. it's the operating one uh, for sure. But you have to think about rare earths. There's two kinds. There's light rare earths and there's heavy rare earths. And there's, important, there's an important distinction. Uh, light rare earths are much more abundant. Uh, the key light rare earth is neodymium, praseodymium are the two minerals that make up about 30% of these magnets. So Boy, that trips pretty... off your tongue very easily. You must have said yeah, that I a know. lot. <laughs> yeah, I probably, yeah, I've said a lot of practice. And uh, this mine in California is very rich in these light rare earths. Uh, however, they've been shipping most of that to, to uh, China to be processed. China still uh, controls over 90% of the processing in these minerals. But importantly, and this is especially important for the e EV industry, by the way, is that you need what's called heavy rare earths in order to increase the performance of these magnets. Heavy rare earths, dysprosium and terbium in particular, the two that are used to increase performance, meaning they, they make the magnets stronger and they also make the magnets more heat resistant to more resistant to heat or to eddy currents, like electrical currents that can occur, especially in a motor and a car. So when you use a magnet in the motor or a car, you're using a lot of these heavy rare earths to increase the performance. China still controls over 98% of those today. Uh, those are not in this uh, this uh, deposit that's in California. We happen to be rich in them, but we're not mining them yet. Uh, and the world really needs to find new sources in order to mitigate this this issue with China. Josh, tell me, I, I, I've read about this massive find in Wyoming. What, what do we have there? Yeah, we've had a few massive finds. Wyoming is one. It has it's a great light rare earth find in Wyoming. However, as with uh, many of the deposits, uh, it still needs to be developed. And what the difference with rare, when you talk about finding rare earths, is if you find a vein of coal, you've got a rich vein and you're just going to go in there and excavate it out in order to use it for electricity. But with rare earths, it's actually dispersed throughout the rock. So you can take out all the rock you want, but you have to actually literally leach it out of the rock to get bulk minerals and then separate out each of those minerals individually into what's called oxides that eventually become metal that we use in magnets and in other alloys. It's a very hard science. It's a science that we've given up on. Uh, we gave it up to China. China's very good at it, by the way, and we're bringing it back. And so each of these deposits are very different from each other. And then you have to develop the science around the deposit in order to tease out the minerals to actually get them to use in the metal alloys that we need. Uh, so we're, we're many years away with many of these deposits today uh, before we can actively use them uh, in production and in technologies. You, you say we're bringing it back, uh, getting the know-how. How are we doing that? So we're doing it a couple of ways. So I, we as a company, we have both a, a large, we're building the one, what we consider the largest domestic magnet facility in the U.S. in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, and we also have a, a, a very uh, unique deposit in West Texas that we're developing. That's what I call heavy in the heavies. We have lots of the heavy rare earths I was describing earlier that we're rich in those. 
And what we're doing is, is two things. One, on the magnet side, uh, we're executing. So what we're bringing in the equipment, we're going to build this facility that ultimately will do roughly 5,000 tons of magnets per year, which is hundreds of millions of magnets. It's a lot of these little guys coming out of there. Uh, and probably seven to $800 million of revenue at its peak. And then in the deposit side, uh, we're developing the processing technology over the past few years in order to get the minerals out of that deposit that are so important. So we've been working very diligently on this the last few years. We still have some work to do, but we've made a lot of progress. We've actually separated out a lot of the minerals now. Uh, we've got a lot of the, we figured out a lot of the ways we're going to mine the mine, uh, but we still have work to do and we're still a few years away. My understanding is that the processing is not environmentally clean, and that's one of the reasons why it left this country. How are you able to process the, these rare earths and do it in an environmentally benign way? Yeah, it's, it's a challenging environment, environmentally. Uh, however, there are ways that you can recycle and reuse the chemicals that are used in the process. So in particular, in mining, uh, we'll be using an open pit mine, which you know will have a big hole in the ground essentially and slowly work down. Uh, and after you excavate that rock, one, there can be a lot of dust that you want to mitigate. Um, and then also you use a lot of acids in order to leach the minerals out of the rock. It's those acids in particular and water uh, that can be an environmental concern. And so what we're looking at closely doing is looking at how we can recycle as much of that acid as possible and reagents throughout the process uh, so that we're keeping it down to a minimum where we can uh, while we're while we're leaching and getting those important minerals uh, that we need so much in this country. You know, my understanding, again, was that China took this on. They didn't care that much about the environment, but I've heard that they're really starting to clean it up. Yeah, well, no, I mean, there's still challenges in China. Uh, I'm sure they've gotten a little better over the years, but the reality is, is that uh, the environmental side is always challenging there. And uh, it's it's a it's a larger cost, right? It'll be more expensive to do it that way. But I like to say we need to be good humans and we need to be thoughtful about the land that we're going to be working on. And we need to do our best to mitigate those those environmental concerns everywhere we can. Can you produce these, uh, process these rare earths and uh, do it in an environmentally clean way and, and still be cost competitive? We will definitely cost more than China. I mean, the reality is, is China is subsidized by the government of uh, these industries. For example, magnets themselves are sold essentially at break even or cost. Hmm. And then they, they get they get credits back from the government, which is where they make their money. I mean, this is this is not a, uh, a competitively fair environment by any means. And I think what's exciting today is that the uh, certainly the American government, the federal government's really looking closely at how they can support this industry at all stages. I mean, it starts with the actual mining. It goes to processing and making the oxides that we need, then making the metals and then making the actual magnets. And the federal government under the Trump administration is actually being very aggressive. They're on fire to figure this out currently and really do everything they can to uh, to help us get on our feet so that we can have a self-sustaining industry over the long term. Yeah, the, the, the Trump administration isn't exactly keen on electric cars, but these rare earths are needed in a lot more than just them, right? Oh, absolutely. These rare earths are critical for our defense. Uh, they're used throughout the defense industry, whether it's the metal alloys themselves or the actual magnets that we'll be producing in Oklahoma. Uh, they're used in uh, semiconductors. They're critical for semiconductors. They're used in MRI machines, for example, in the export control list that came out a few weeks ago from China controlling the export of these rare earths, there's listed gadolinium. Gadolinium is the contrasting agent we used when we get MRI scans, right? So you can see all your organs. So this is a very personal event that's happening to us now as well. This could affect how well we can get MRI scans done. Or yttrium is used to actually fight cancer, certain types of cancer. So these are very important minerals. They're used throughout a myriad of technologies. Uh, well outside just EVs, even in a gas-powered car, you could have them in your power steering. Your power steering, you could have them in your actuators, uh, your your driver assistant technologies, braking, and so forth. It's all over a car, uh, so these are these are critically important uh, and something that we need to develop here in America. Mm -hmm. um, so the auto industry is looking at asynchronous motors that don't use any magnets at all. Is is are there other workarounds on on this? There are challenges to that. Uh, you know, I'd never say never, but as we're looking over the next 10, 15 years or so, uh, the challenge is, is 
what is great about these, what are called uh, neo-magnets, these rare earth-centered neo-magnets, NDFEB magnets is what they're called, is that they're incredibly powerful. And so you can have an incredible amount of power in a very small package. And that reduces the weight in a car. Uh, it allows you to have more torque. You put Tesla into beast mode and you go and you go so fast, you know, you feel like you're on a, on a roller coaster. That's these magnets. And it's the power of these centered rare earth magnets. And if you, when you use other technologies, at least everything we know today, you add a lot more weight. They're not quite as powerful. Uh, and there's other challenges with them. So it's not going to be an easy fix. Uh, there may be times when you can find other fixes around it, but right now they're the best answer uh, for what the technologies that we have today by a long shot. It's great to see you working on this, but you know, permitting in the United States seems to take forever. It takes a decade or more to open a mine. I, I've got to believe as you go to, to process these things and uh, you're going to have to have all kinds of environmental impact statements. Is there any way to accelerate the process here? Yeah, well, there's two things in our favor. Uh, one is that our deposits on state land in Texas, so it's less of a federal issue for us. Uh, not that the state of Texas won't have its own permitting, but it, it's going to be a much different scenario than if we were on federal land, without a doubt. But also, even for those deposits on federal land, uh, the Trump administration, that's where they're actually moving quite quickly. They're doing a lot right now to re reduce the burden of that permitting. And then hopefully we can find a balance that we can hold to over the long term that allows mines to get developed in a meaningful meaningfully normal amount of time, not not decades, uh, but one of which we're doing it responsibly for our land as well. Can the U.S. realistically become self-sufficient in rare earths? Absolutely, we could. Yeah, we've got plenty of, of minerals here in the U.S. Uh, we just, we need to be able to get to them and, and get them out of the ground and do it responsibly. But yeah, absolutely, I believe it'll take a while. I mean, we're gonna have to augment with the rest of the world in the next couple of decades, for sure. Uh, we, you know, I think we should do that in a more diversified and thoughtful manner than having it all depend on one country. Uh, but I think over time we, we can develop this in America and have a good balance between uh, using and, and, and purchasing what we need from our neighbors and allies, as well as developing uh, what we have and the great resources we have here in America. Oh, that's a good point. Who other than China has, has got these and processes them? Well, very few process them. Many countries have them. Uh, I mean, the Trump administration has talked a lot about Ukraine and Greenland. Uh, Ukraine honestly doesn't actually have very many rare earths. They have many other critical minerals. Rare earths is not one of them. Uh, Greenland has a lot, but they're decades away, at least a couple decades away from really exploiting those minerals. Uh, but they're abundant in Australia and Africa. Uh, there's other areas in Asia, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam. Uh, there's there's quite a few countries that have these. They're pretty prevalent. They're not as rare as you might think, hmm. even though we call them rare earth. They're rare because they're just hard. <laughs> That's really why they're rare. So they're, we can find them. Uh, it's just a matter of, of looking and, and getting down into the science in order to extract them from the rock. Mm -hmm. But pretty much nobody else processes them then? Pretty much no one else. I mean, there is a couple companies now. Linus out of Australia is one of the bigger ones. Uh, and then there is uh, MP Materials here in the U.S. who's just beginning to process their own, uh, but they're at the beginning stages. And then there are a couple other smaller companies who are working on it, uh, and then ourselves, of course, who are we're progressing our own technologies. But we're still we've got work to do as a nation, without a doubt. And so I, what I call this is this is the Manhattan Project moment, right, for the United States, at least in terms of rare earths. Is we need to invest, uh, we need support in order to partner with with the government the great scientists we have in the government in order to figure this out and do this as quickly as we possibly can to stand ourselves on our own feet. Yeah, what you're talking here is not just uh, helping the U.S. auto industry keep pace uh, with China's auto industry. You're, you're talking national security issues here. Yes, we are. Right now, quite literally, in order to make many of the technologies that we need for our national security, we have to ask permission to China. That's where we're at today. Yeah. Josh Ballard, thanks so much for your time. Very interesting, encouraging, but boy, there's a big hill to climb here. Yeah, there is. Thank you for having me on, John. I appreciate it. It's an exciting time. We're building hell of an asset out there in, in Oklahoma, and we're excited to get that out there so we can start supporting the, the automobile industry as well as defense and others. Do you want to see the automotive industry grow and thrive? So do we. That's why we dedicate our shows to providing the people in the industry with important data and information and access to the people who are driving the industry forward with the guests that we bring on our shows and the interviews that we conduct. But we need your help to continue doing it. 
That's why I'm asking you to support AutoLine with a YouTube or Patreon membership. It'll get you extra content that will be available only to members, but it will especially make sure that you and AutoLine continue to drive the automotive industry forward.